Welcome to what I'm calling part two of the forensic toolkit demo video thing. Okay. About two years ago, I reposted the demo video I had made prior to that over FTK 7.4. And it was about 43 minutes, well received, I think. And uh, it's been a bit of time, and we are now on version 8.0. Now you might be saying, well, what happened to the demo videos for 7.5 and 7.6? And then we went to eight, so there's no seven and all that sort of stuff. Well, while there's a lot of updates, the general flow of the software did not change between 7.4 and 7.5 and 7.5 and 7.6. A lot of new features for sure, and you can check those out in feature focus videos that I've done on the channel. Go watch those specifically, okay? But overall, the interface, how you approach your data and the general workflows didn't change in FTK to justify a new video demo type thing. However, with 8.0, we have changed a lot of things in how we approach, how we display the data, how you are going to approach reviewing the data and basically an entirely new interface option for you as you approach your investigation. So I think with that, it merits a sequel to our original demo video. So that is what this is. So if you haven't seen part one, I'll link it somewhere. However, YouTube does it in the description as well. Be sure to go and check out that video because it still is relevant again, as far as the general flow of the interface and how you can work with things in what we now call the core interface uh, view. So uh, yeah, this is part two of that. We'll be covering mostly 8.0 stuff, but I will touch on some key changes in features and stuff as we go through in core. All right, let's jump into it. Okay, so what I have up is the database and case management window. This should look familiar. Okay, notice that it is 8.0. And as far as this interface, nothing has changed. And let me walk you through why. From this view, we know that we can see any databases that we're connected to and then the associated cases in that database that are assigned to this user. I'm an admin, so I see all this stuff. Now, if I come down and I wanna open up the main case, when I double click on that, I'm presented with a new window in 8.0. And it gives me the option of opening this case in core view, or I can open it in smart view. Okay. Now core view is the legacy or interface that you know and love that FTK has had for a long time. We'll talk about why you might still want to open it up in that view here in a little bit. In smart view, is a review interface that is available for every version of FTK as well as the core view. So FTK standalone, FTK lab, FTK enterprise. And really the smart view is a reskinned and new feature full version of FTK central. So if you have FTK central or are looking into getting into FTK central, um, watch some videos on that. I probably posted on what those are. If not subscribe, watch soon. But again, uh, the smart view is a review interface that sits on top of that. Okay. So you can choose which way you want to open your case as, uh, from this screen and you can set it as a default if you want for this case, the decision is on a case by case basis. Now I'm going to start with core view just to open it up in an interface we are familiar with and we know. Now, the reason I open it up in core view is because core view still has all the features that we've covered in previous videos and with any updates uh, that have come out with 8.0 and optimizations in the database backend, which have been significant and different optimizations with a bunch of other processing options that, such as windows, thumbnails and different stuff like that. But if you wanted to do data carving, which we've covered, or you need to look at the hex or you need to configure column sets or filters or things like that, run the Python scripter, all these types of deep dive uh, type features. This is where you want to live. Okay. The core view is designed for that. Now I love the smart view, but this is where that kind of mentality will thrive because it's going to give you access to the low level stuff that we've talked about and you may use all the time. 
So we've loaded into here. We could look through our case and all the tabs and different stuff, but you'll notice here in 8.0 and above, we have a button called Smart View. This replaces the FTK Plus button that used to be there. Okay, and if we click on Smart View, it's actually gonna fire off a web browser that opens up the Smart View or a, like I said, a reskinned and featureful FTK Central so that you can enter forensic review. And that's the first thing we need to understand about the Smart View is this is designed for users for forensic review. What does that mean? Well, if you're an examiner, you've been doing this for a while, you know, hey, there's some cases where I have to go down in the hex and put stuff together and look at the database and how it's structured and manually reconfigure stuff, all that sort of stuff that you do need to know how to do and it happens all the time, not all the time, but you get what I'm saying. And you know, you have that. But a lot of your cases, at least when I was working, is find this photo, find these types of photos, read these documents, read these emails, read these chats, and you're just going through and you're reviewing information to build a case or whatever the case may be, okay? That is what this is designed for. It's designed with filtering in mind to bring these large data sets into small data sets and allow you to quickly move through your data and build your case as quickly as possible. So, so let's walk through some of the key features and workflows associated with the smart view. The first thing I wanna focus on is administration of the view. Okay, and that sounds like a weird term, but up here in the top left, we can hit a drop down. In any cases that the user that is logged in to FTK is assigned will be viewable here. I find this a really helpful change because I can switch quickly between cases, unlike in FTK Core where you currently have to either close it down to reopen the database management window or you have to open up another instance of FTK to get the case, I can just quickly swap through my cases and it'll load into the interface available for me to start working that sort of case. So first off, easy case management. Right below that, you'll see an evidence select. Now I only have one image loaded up right now, but if you had multiple images, mobile devices, computers, jump drives, etc., you would see them listed here and this allows you to easily control what evidence items are loaded into this, the view. Up here in the top right is your user controls. You can log out, uh, change your password, etc. If you wanna switch it to white mode, you can switch it up here as well. However, I prefer dark mode, which again is one of those new features that we've added in this new interface that Core didn't have. You're always uh, in white mode in FTK Core. So uh, first new feature there. So once you're in your case and you have your evidence selected, maybe one of the first places you're going to start is the Explorer pane here on the left side of the screen. The quick filter will provide you with some easy filters that don't have a lot of customizability because they're designed for just quick looks, hence the name of your data. So for example, I don't have any carved files, but if we wanted to look there, I have bookmarked files, so if I wanna see all my bookmarked files, I can quickly select that. Notice there's no real way to organize it from this, we'll, we'll show you how to do that later, what they are. Why? Because this is a quick filter. You just wanna get an idea for what maybe you've bookmarked here really quick, just get a list, look through them, that sort of thing. Maybe you just wanna export quickly all the bookmarked files, that type of thing. You can see geolocation, so if we select that, all the files with geolocation data will quickly be returned, no real organization at this point, we'll get there, but they're listed, okay? So that's what this is for, this quick filter, is to get a quick idea of various types of data within your case. Dropping down to common filter, now is where the filters gain a little bit more complexity, and I say a little bit, because that's exactly what I mean. So for example, in our bookmarks example here, I come down and now, it's yes, I could select everything, but now I can get into um, just addressing a specific one, right? Like, okay, hey, I wanna look at comparison images and now I only see those bookmarks instead of all of them. And again, both have their uses. Quick, I just wanna see all bookmark files. Let me, let me do a quick secondary review of those or maybe I want to export them out, etc. But now it's like, well, I wanna see what I have put into comparison images and I can come in and take a look at that, okay? So these filters in this area have a bit more granularity with how you can approach it. 
Some of these common filters like bookmarks are inline, they expand out, but other ones like extensions will pop out into another window and allow you to go through and add multiple things and different stuff in the extensions to filter down your files. So you can do that as well. We'll go ahead and collapse common filters and we have artifacts. Now this is where you may spend a bunch of your time. Within the artifacts drop down are things that FTK has parsed or just naturally user created files or things that typically the user that or the system's going to interact with that you may want to analyze. So for example, chat applications, sure, databases, documents, email, geolocation. So if I come in and I wanna see documents, I can come in and expand documents. I can either view all of the different types of documents or I can view Microsoft Word documents. And what's gonna happen is our grid now filters our case down. So all the Microsoft Office type documents are loaded in. Now it'll load in dot doc, dot doc x, dot dot m, all that sort of stuff uh, that are associated with Microsoft Word. I'll show you later how you can filter those out to get down to just Microsoft documents. But you can see spreadsheets in here as well. Again, it'll associate anything with spreadsheet templates and all that sort of stuff in there. That's why we have over 2000. Uh, v cards for location stuff and contact cards. If you have mobile data loaded in, you get the idea within documents. If I deselect that, our grid will reset to showing everything because we don't have any filters on. The last item over here on the Explorer filter pane is just a disk viewer. Okay, you can navigate down and you know exp expand the things and select a directory to view. Honestly, if you need to do this, I would recommend switching back over into core view and doing it in the explore pane because there's a lot more features around navigating the directory tree and it's it flows a little better, it loads it out, it's a bit more viewable in the core view. And again, I feel like navigating a directory tree is more of those lower level type of reviews. That's not typically something you do. You wanna leverage the software and what it's bringing to the top for you first, get that low hanging fruit. And then if you have to go there, I'd recommend jumping back into uh, core view to do any sort of this. But if you are in smart view and you just wanna stay here, that option is available to you to manually uh, navigate the file structure and you know view a directory or something like that. So while we're here, let's take a look at the grid. And to take a look at the grid, one thing I'll do is I'll bring back our Microsoft Word documents. This is the grid or the list view. And this is similar pretty much in what it displays to the file list pane in FTK Core. So, you know, columnized data, rows, that type of information. There's a few little differences to the way that the file list, sometimes referred to as the grid, works in Smart Review versus the way that it works in Core though. In Core, we have a very robust filter system. We covered that in the other video. In this one, that hasn't made the migration yet. And so the way that you filter here is through the column header. And so for example, here looking at Microsoft Documents, if I scan over, I have the extension column. And so I want to open up my filter and say I want docs and I want doc X's. We'll just show that first. And so it returns a lot of stuff. Now dot docs are also used for log files and uh, system files and stuff like that that we might not care about. Maybe we want to isolate in on just doc X's, which are typically what a user would create or interact with. So we can come in here and deselect dot docs dot doc and reapply it. And now we're down to just dot doc X. The other thing that you should be aware of is to maintain speed of the interface. FTK can load in hundreds of thousands, millions of items and handle it just fine. And you know, with the database and the ability to parse it and display it. But one of the things that we found could make it a little quicker is by only displaying a certain amount of things at a time. The default is 100 items per page. So if I come back up here and I click on my filter and I clear that and I decide, okay, hey, I want everything in here. Notice that I actually have 18 pages at 100. If I want that, that's cool. I can also crank it up to 200 or 500 and it'll load 500 items and notice it drops down to four pages. So you do have control over how many um, 
items are displayed and loaded into the grid at a time. The grid is pretty simple. The grid is the grid, it's the file list view. You filter based on the column headers, okay? Pretty straightforward. If I deselect Microsoft Word documents and I come down and let's take a look at images to segue ourselves into the next view type. And notice when I selected the graphics that the column set for this page changed to graphics. So we have brought across the auto column switch from core view into FTK central. And it works with this artifact based uh, filter system here in the Explorer pane. So if you're off in some other places and I'll show you how to filter that, you may or may not get the correct column set based on your filter because you may have different types of things. I may have images and videos. And so at that point, it's gonna display something else. But you can drop down and select any column set you want. You can even create one custom one that'll be in the interface. And then you can also create custom columns in the admin panel as it stands right now. So with graphics on, what we're gonna do is we're gonna swap over to the thumbnail view. Now thumbnails are thumbnails, except we've added a lot of optimizations to the way we handle thumbnails and working with graphics and video in FTK 8.0. Don't just think that 8.0 was this fresh coat of paint with a new interface with no new features. Nope, we've loaded in a bunch of new features. Um, Again, you see the thumbnails. One of the first things you might notice is the way that we handle duplicates. We've made duplicates much more obvious when looking. You'll see this stacked type graphic for this image. The other thing that we do is we put a number on the stack, on the duplicates to tell you how many duplicates there are. So for example, this one has four duplicates. This one has two, this one has two. Uh, some three in here, et cetera. So very obvious that there is duplicates. If you were to come in here and select one and then bookmark it, notice save two bookmarks uh, successfully, it does all the duplicates in the stack, okay? So you don't have to go find the other dupes, it will display it. Now, I'm gonna show you while we're here and we have this guy selected with two duplicates, if I come over here to the right and say show info, it's gonna give me the information about this file. If I come up here and select duplicate, I now get both records here for each duplicate file. If I came over here and selected the one with four, notice that I have the four duplicates listed out here and I can perform actions and do whatever I wanna do. So the information tab can give you some indications about where those duplicates are, you know, etc. Notice in the one with the four dupes, one had a different name. Of course, it's using MD5 and SHA to do those matches, so it doesn't matter about a name change. I'll hide the info tab. So we're stacking the duplicates, we're giving you the count. We've also added keyboard shortcuts for the bookmarking. So if I select this, I do shift two, and it's gonna go ahead and bookmark that. Of course, you have an easy thumbnail slider. We can display the information in the names because notice we don't have a file list pane in this one because we're doing review, we're just looking through. But sometimes you wanna know, okay? Hey, here's the names, etc. I can select this Jeep picture and if I come back to the information for this Jeep picture, it's gonna load up its information. We just saw that. But now, what if I wanna look at a file and so notice that this is in Google Drive and I wanna see other stuff that's in that directory? I can go ahead and click on Google Drive. It's gonna open up a new tab in the interface and show me all the images that are in Google Drive. So I don't need to go through the Evidence Explorer to look at that. This is similar to our right-click view in a different tab, but you can click the directory in uh, the file path there listed in the info pane to take a look at it. It's gonna kick you back over to the grid because again, you're looking at a directory and that's it's guessing that's a good place to start. Now you can of course close that and you come back to your thumbnail view. So we'll go ahead and close our info tab. Now, one thing you may notice is as I mouse around, as I do, because I'm spastic with the mouse, if I stop on a graphic, it will do a hover and, and you can see a larger thing. My eyesight is still good enough that I don't really need that feature. And so what I can do is actually come in and turn it off. And that way, when I mouse over, I don't get that hover. It's totally up to you. Maybe if you've cranked your thumbnails down a bit smaller, and then you want to see details on say this image, maybe I'll turn back my hover on, I can come in and 
take a look at the hover. This can be especially useful with videos. So if I select a video, now if you're gonna review videos, you wanna come in and make sure you've muted video and audio, okay? You don't have to, but I'd recommend it. And then if you come in, you can highlight over that and it'll play. And if we didn't have the audio muted, we would hear the audio as well. So you can get an idea of you know what the video is by mousing over and watching that video. I'm gonna go ahead and turn hover off. I don't need that on. And I'm gonna jump back into images. While in images, especially for our uh, law enforcement professionals who are viewing CSAM cases and you know that's a bunch of garbage you don't wanna have up on your screen uh, all the time and you wanna minimize that. One thing you can come in and do is turn on pixelate so that as you bookmark, things will pixelate. Now, the other thing you can do is, let's say you're in a situation where um, you may need to bookmark everything, even the stuff that's like not, you know, something that you need. So you can come in to this dropdown, hit the dropdown, and you can either do the viewed images or the tagged images. So if I just say, hey, I want to only do the tagged images because everything needs to be tagged and I need to go through and mark things as relevant, not relevant, specific bookmarks, labels, etc. I can come in, you know, we've got three faces of Voltron here. I could bookmark it and notice now I got two and I bookmarked that one and I bookmarked that one and they go away. And this would be an easy way to kind of check off everything as you go through. Once you run out of stuff, you're, you're done. So up to you on how you visualize that data. I can always bring them back by turning that off and I can turn off the pixelate simply by toggling makes it really easy to go back and forth. The last thing I wanna focus on on the thumbnail view is something we put in that makes it super easy to filter graphics on common filtered items. You can see here in the list, you've got size, you've got make, model, city, etc. So if I come down to make and I select that, this drop down box over here on the left pops up. And it starts with Apple because Apple starts with A, just list some alphabetical. But let's say I wanted to look at Canon. So I'm gonna hit Canon and there we go. All these images were shot by a Canon. <laughs> Context matters with that sentence, I guess. And so now we're in the space we can go through because hey, our suspect used a Canon, let's start there. And it was two clicks and we're in, okay? So we can of course switch out and we could go, hey, I'm gonna come over to DJI and run that. So we can come back up to Apple and we can review that. Now we could also swap our groups. So we could come down and do uh, location city and turn it to that. We could come in and say, all right, hey, I wanna look at Beverly Hills. Here's all the pictures in this case uh, that were shot in Beverly Hills. So you can zero down very quickly. Now, if I select one of these and I come over to my info tab, we do have the additional mapped pin on here. So if I don't know exactly where Beverly Hills is in Texas, uh, mind you, um, it's gonna put a pin down. We can zoom in and kind of get an idea of where this graphic was taken. And we can see just outside of Waco is Beverly Hills, Texas. We can get an idea there of what's going on. We also get some increased EXIF data with the date time and then you can see the exif data in here if you need to do deeper dives you know, on that type of thing so all right we'll close the info tab and that's all what we're going to cover as far as the optimizations and enhancements that we've made to the thumbnail view now i'm going to clear my filters to none and i'm going to actually turn off images for this now let's jump over to the smart grid. This feature is built from the ground up new for 8.0, not based on anything in core, unless you wanna say it's loosely based on the overview system, but it really, that would not be doing it justice. So this is a visual filter system so that you can dynamically build a filter and see kind of what the results are gonna be as you build them and know what works and what doesn't. Because it adjusts all your options as you apply different things, you will never be able to build a filter that comes out to zero. So let's jump in and show it. So right now I've defaulted to the graphics column set because that's what I had on when I switched over to it. But let's say I wanna look into user behavior, okay? I'm gonna come down and I'm gonna to go to summary information 
recent, and I'm going to say recent files and folders, shortcuts, LNK files or link files. And that's going to load up all the columns associated with our LNK files, which is going to give us an indication of what the user has been doing on this system. Now the smart grid is based on the column sets within FTK. First off, we have usernames, file names, extensions, all the things that would be associated with a link file. But let's say we're looking into data exfiltration. So we scan over and we see drive type, fixed, unknown, drive removable. Let's take a look at the drive removable. So I go ahead and I select that and I hit apply. Now what? notice how the interface adjusted only the things that are drive removable of drive type are remaining in here. So I can't select a volume serial number and a drive removable that don't match. It won't let me. So with everything filtered down, I can now say, okay, hey, is this the file list I want to look at? It's still pretty large. We still have quite a few files that may come back in this scenario. And so maybe I want to do a bit more. Specifically, let's start moving through the jump drive. So we can start a good guy. We'll just start at the top. We'll move through them. So I can hit apply. It'll filter down. And so I'm, I'm down to just that drive and everything else filtered down as well. So now what I'm left with is these are the three uh, Windows usernames that were logged in when this jump drive was plugged in at various times. Okay, I have the file names that the user has clicked on while that drive was plugged in, some extension information, some pathing information. So I can see that this drive, what was a good guy, was mounted as drive G, drive H. Um, you can see the, the drive letters there. You can see the dates and times associated with this link file. So last access time, last write time, okay? When was the file created, that sort of thing. Okay, we kind of get an idea of what it is. Now, maybe looking at these file names, they're not indicative of anything that I really care about, all right? Data exfiltration, none of this stuff is, you know, maybe anything I care about. Maybe the fact that they just had jump drives plugged into the machine is, infer is you know, data, but for right now, no. So we want to go back and we'll clear that filter. Notice things will pop back in. Once everything's popped back in, we can go to the next one and hit apply. It'll filter down. We can scan back over and take a look at these. Okay. So we have, you know, okay, maybe this second Excel doc is something indicative of data exfiltration. So we're like, okay, hey, we're on the right track. This has been mounted as G drive, H drive. We've even got some I drives. We can see some directories that they've interfaced with, some dates, of course, etc. Now at this point, we could switch over to the grid and view these link files uh, to see if we want to include any report. Let's say that Timothy was the username that we're interested in. So before we start looking at them, we can either filter here in the column, or it might be easier to come back to this and select Timothy and hit apply and notice how everything again filters down. Second Excel doc, if that's what we're looking for, I can come back over to the grid, okay, and you know, second Excel doc. Now I'm going to jump back into smart grid. So from here, we didn't have any filters turned on in the artifacts or quick filters or anything. We just kind of went in with everything. So I can go ahead and clear this and that's going to populate everything back in. Notice it blasted out our filter. And right here is where you'll see all filter chips that aren't column filters applied up here at the top. But let's say, okay, hey, I want to come in and I want to look at documents and Microsoft Word documents. Notice that the column set automatically shifts from recent files and folders to Microsoft documents. So I've already done an initial filter. You can see that at the top of Microsoft Docs. So we can, we've filtered down. So we can look through the di different attributes here and we can see the author information. So maybe I'm looking for a specific user um, of, you know, a document. So I might come down and say, you know, okay, here, here's Raylan Givens, but it's also got some other stuff. Praying for rain. Let's go ahead and select that. It looks like there's only one document that applies to that. So we'll filter it down. We get a straight across. Okay. It's fires in California. But if I were to switch over to the grid, and go ahead and select that and hit the view and now I can read my document. So the smart grid is a very visual, easy and efficient way to take a lot of data, bring it down. And like I said, 
it's compatible with the columns of FTK, so you have a lot of different things to choose from. And, and so it's about what investigation are you running, what type of data are you looking for, where can you go from there? The last view that we're gonna look at is the timeline view. Now the timeline view has a lot of customizability to it. And the way that the timeline view works is up at the top, you're going to have your, you're gonna have your data loaded up. Now, one of the problems with timestamps is that uh, certain certificates and stuff are gonna have some weird stuff. So I just wanna show like when you come in, the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is filter down to the types of files you want to look at. In this case, let's just stick with Microsoft Word documents. We've been in that space. So notice that our timeline here no longer goes from the year 1970 to the year 6000. It's in a believable amount of time, okay? Now, we can see the, the information here over on the right and we could zoom in. Right now we're covering over 20 years, maybe close to 30 years. We wanna zoom in on the most recent stuff, okay? So we're gonna bring it all the way down up here to 2020. I can also slide this back and forth to kind of zero in on what I wanna do. But we're just gonna leave it right here for now. And you can see, okay, we, we have all this stuff. Now, there's a lot of date stamps. The way that the timeline shows things is for every date timestamp, a document will appear in the times timeline. If it's an image with EXIF and stuff, you're gonna have all those dates associated with it. And so if you wanna build a timeline of a file, you need to know where things happened. But maybe all you care about is when stuff was modified. Well, you can come in and say, okay, I'm looking at documents. I'm just gonna say, hey, only display the times for last modified date. I hit apply. Notice my timeline on the top zooms in and then my timeline adjusts, okay? And I can see the documents here. Now we have a bunch of documents here and maybe I wanna see two different dates. Well, I can go ahead and select this one and say add to compare. And now I have 5720 right here and 101519 up here in these dates. So I start at two different locations. Now this is just picked at random, the compare, but you can scan both of these and take a look at your data. But the idea would be is maybe I wanna compare two Mondays. Okay. Or maybe I want to compare Monday to Tuesday if I was looking at like login data or activity data dealing with uh, network information or something like that. Now, if I scan over just a touch, we have this drop down here. The other thing that we can do is compare different devices, different evidence items. Now, I only have one evidence item loaded up in this one, but if I had my other image in here that I normally have loaded up, WinSync, um, we could have WinSync on one side and Conspiracy on the other, and we could compare the same date, but across two different devices. We're gonna jump off of timeline. We're gonna go back to the grid. We'll open up our, our pane here. We have Microsoft Documents, cool. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of rapid fire through some of the uh, features that allow you to take a look at this stuff. So once we're in Microsoft Documents, we're gonna come over, we're gonna filter down our extension because we just want docx's in here. So we got our docx's. I can select one, I don't even know what this one is. Scan over, second Word document, whatever that is. We can take a look at it by opening the View tab. So this is my first Word document using Windows 10 and Office 365, which has headers, that blah, blah, blah. Okay, cool, whatever. If I open up the information tab, I have uh, these dates here, and this works with any type of file. Okay, I have, okay, it was created on this date, last modified on this date, so it looks like it was copied to this partition on this date, but probably originally modified slash created on this date, which matches when they timed it in. Anyway, so we wanna see created date, so we'll go ahead and click on that, and it's gonna open up the mini timeline. and notice it's right here and so now what i can see based on my filters is what has happened around it okay and so we can see in the mini timeline in this case we don't have any scroll because of the number of documents but we have this here uh to see what has happened around it okay so we can open up that mini timeline by clicking on one of the dates associated with that file and go ahead and close down the mini timeline and we'll close down information.
Now let's get a better one here, a little longer one. Uh, we'll try this Alienware FX uh, type thing. Uh, so let's say we want to search uh, a document. I can, while in the view pane, I can hit this little magnifying glass and I can say um, user. Uh, so we got a gajillion hits, 23 of them. But okay, I, I get some context here. I can skip through and select on them and notice that I can jump through the document and take a read at um, what's going on in this uh, document, okay, based on my user search. And then I could search something else, you know, like, I don't know, um, integer, okay? So if I search for integer, I got 10, 12, 13, two on 12 actually, and two on 13. So you can kind of jump through and take a look. Let's say we're not already in the document, Okay, we close our view pane. Let's say um, we search for the term government. Okay. And now we have these files here. So I select one and I hit the view pane. Notice that we had searched for government. It filtered down our list to just hits in government. But also when we open up the view, I already have my uh, search in, uh, you know, embedded in here, and then I can jump between the two hits. The search does have an advanced search option where you can include duplicates or exclude duplicates, family, near duplicates, synonyms, regex, all that sort of stuff to where you can increase the quality of your search. Um, you can also save your search so that you can just load it in next time if it's something that you save or something that you search, you know, a lot. Let's go ahead and clear our filters and we'll reset our case. One of the things that I did cover in the last video, part one, over the core view of 7.4 is mobile, is the mobile tab. Now, the mobile tab has actually seen a lot of updates from 7.4 to 7.5 and then 7.5 to 7.6, and especially a lot of updates coming from 7.6 into 8.0. So we're gonna take a look specifically at some of the updates that we've made to the way that we handle mobile data, but we're going to focus in on those updates in the smart review interface because I think they make the most impact in that view. So while we navigate to the mobile data and load some chat conversations in, I should say that in, in the part one video, I talk about how we can bring in reports from Celebrite and XRY. One thing that we've improved is while yes, we can still bring in reports from Celebrite and XRY, we can also bring in the raw output from Celebrite, XRY, Grayshift, and many others and parse that out without them having to parse it out first. FTK can be really, really useful, more useful than what it was back when I made that 741 um, to mobile investigations. So be sure to check that out. So I've loaded up conversations, not much information you can see here in the columns, but that's because if you go ahead and select one, we'll just select the first one and hit the view pane, we load up into a conversation view, okay? You can see we render in the pictures, if there's any emojis, those would be rendered in as well, okay? But you can see the chat and you can go through and read them, cool. But what if you want to label something or bookmark something. Well, up here at the top, click to select label. So at this point I can select the label. I have the project VIX stuff loaded in, which I'll talk about a little later, but I'm gonna say is suspected. And I can, with that selected, I can say, okay, this one, I'm gonna label that. And I'm gonna label that one as well. And that way, you know, it's like bookmarking, same, same idea, okay? I could do that with the bookmarks as well, okay? So please select the bookmark. I'd come in, shared media category, child abuse material. I come in and I'm saying, yep, that's child abuse material, etc. So is this one, okay? And I can come through and, and label. If I wanna switch, I can just drop up here, comparison image, yep, this is a comparison image right there. And I can go through and bookmark right in the chat. Now, a lot of organizations, both government, law enforcement, corporate, use privileged work set. Well, we can do that here in the chat as well. So I can say, hey, I'm gonna activate my privilege mode. I'm gonna flag as privilege. We could do flag dupl duplicates, family, etc. I just wanna do uh, normal, cause I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna say, yep, this one's privileged. I don't want that. 
and I've already marked those, and this one's privileged as well, but I also labeled it just in case I need that later, etc. Now, if you do mark something privileged and then have a reviewer come in with the, the permission set in such a way that they can't view privileged documents, they're not going to see anything where those messages were. It would look like as if they had not sent anything, okay? There just wouldn't be a bubble there, all right? Same if you load in the chat messages, okay? If I turn off chat conversation and we get our chat messages, okay? I can turn this off, look at it in grid, but you can see all these filtered items and different things, okay? Um, you know, you can view it this way as well, but as we were filtering and bookmarking stuff in that conversation view, it was also doing it here, of course, because we break out each of the individual messages. Because maybe you just need a table view, you want access to these filters so you can filter the messages down how you wanna do it. So we offer you different ways to do it. One thing I wanna mention is that we put a lot of work into Project Vic and Project Cade support. Up here at the top, if you enable the Project Vic and Project Cade media categories, it imports automatically and sets up the keyboard shortcuts necessary to categorize your images. So if I open up our tag menu here and go to bookmarks, you can see the, in this case, since I'm in the US, Project Vic loaded up and the categories associated with product Project Vic. And then also in the coding panel, it'll have the federal sentencing enhancement guidelines if you want to also or need to uh, include those enhancements with your report. To activate this feature, you do need the law enforcement tag on your dongle. So if you are a law enforcement agency and you're unable to get access to the VIC and or CADE uh, features, just reach out to your account manager and they'll be able to add that to your dongle, no problem, so that you can categorize those very easily. We also support exporting to the Vic and Cade uh, formats for easy upload, at least in the States, back to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, or NCMEC. Up here at the top, you'll notice that we keep a count of the various uh, you know, categories for Project Vic and how many bookmarks you have put in each category. And of course, if you want to look at anything you have uh, tagged with Vic um, or Cade, uh, you can just click on that filter up at the top. It'll apply that filter and only the stuff that you've applied that uh, bookmark to will appear. Now, of course, with the Project Vic and Project Cade, we do have pre-processing categorization. You can load in the Vic data sets and the Cade data sets, of course. You can create your own if you have like um, known victims and known cases that you've worked that's not up in Vic yet. You keep them in KFF. You can use those as well side by side not a problem, okay? You can run both, all, some, none. It doesn't matter. Let's select a document, open up our view pane, and we can read the document here. This is only one page, super simple. Now, what I have here is I can pop it out. We have true two monitor support now. I can move this off onto another monitor. I can view this information, whatever. I can still run my searches. So if I say uh, join, you know, it's right in there, we can, you know, whatever. So I can have my grid, my timeline, all that sort of stuff in one monitor and then have everything viewed off to the side, giving you a bit more real estate to take a look. While I'm in this popped out right here, the other thing I want to address with the view pane is I can switch here from native to image to text. If I come to image, what this does is it converts this document to basically a graphic file that allows me to do some stuff with it. So um, while in this format, I can select this little box and I can give it a reason that says, hey, um, this is confidential. And then I can block out this paragraph and I'll put this little reason here. I don't have to select a reason. I can then select save redactions and then burn in the redaction so that it's set there. And now when I go and create a production, which is what you have to do to get these types of files out, you have a redacted file. You can do this in graphic images as well. If you're law enforcement say, and you've got pictures and your confidential informants in there, or you have undercover officers and you wanna redact their faces, et cetera, you can go through and do that as well. You go ahead and if you close this, it drops it back into the main interface and then you can close the view pane. 
back into the interface. In conclusion, I don't know how long this has been and I'm gonna wrap it up now. But in conclusion, one thing you may have noticed through this long demo video is that we're running in a web browser. But if you look at the URL, black line is the name of my machine. We are pointed at a local device. This hooks to the same backend database as FTK core. What you do in one interface as far as labeling or bookmarking will translate over to core and vice versa core into smart review. Let's say you do some additional analysis, process some new files, add some new evidence. No matter which interface you do that in, it will sync between both. Okay. Now, if you have both open at the same time, like I do, you may have to refresh the interface, not a problem, but what you do in one, you do in the other. We launch it in a web browser for two main reasons. One, it allows us to unify the interface between all the different FTK products, especially going forward. We have just launched also a SaaS version of FTK and FTK Smart Review slash FTK Central is really designed for also being able to do remote review. Okay, look for videos on that. And so by launching this in a web browser, it allows us to unify the review interface across the stack so that if you start with Deadbox standalone one machine FTK and your agency grows and now you wanna get lab or enterprise or expand out to central for web-based review, it's not a big deal. You know every bit of the interface and you're ready to go. Minimize on that excess training or learning curve, minimizing the downtime, maximizing effectiveness. So that's the first reason is unifying the interface across the platform. The second reason is this code base allows our developers to iterate quicker, release features faster, and stay up to date with the changing landscape of forensic. So even though it's running in a web browser, it's still on metal if you want it to be. So I hope this demo gives you a bit of a, an idea of what we've been up to in the last little bit. A lot of new stuff here. Again, if you have any questions or comments, you can either email me at justin.tolman at xtero.com or of course put a comment down in the comments. I would subscribe to the channel because um, I release a lot of content on FTK and forensics and different stuff. And that way you can stay up to date. Also it'll influence the algorithm to give you more forensic stuff. And that's always a good thing. Uh, Learning is always good. So again, thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one.